What's the most important ability a race driver possesses? I just have to say bravery, because a guy who gets out there and does 125 to 200 miles an hour without a blink of an eye, that's pretty courageous if you ask me. I think the driver has to have good eyesight. Good reflexes. I think one of the most important abilities is uh, to put together good uh, race sponsorship. Good mechanical knowledge. Hi, I'm Skip Barber. Sure, all these factors matter, but we've found that intelligence and determination are really the main ingredients. What we'd like to do in this presentation is show you the areas of skill that a driver needs to master and the areas of knowledge that he needs to acquire and then put these skills and knowledge in a logical progression so that you can see what the race driver has to do to really go faster. We've been in the business of training race drivers for 12 years, and over 8,000 drivers have taken advantage of picking our instructors' brains, dozens of race drivers with over hundreds of years of racing experience between them. Some of them have gone on to greater things. A certain fellow from Kentucky doesn't feel he needs to work for us anymore. The others continue through the school to pass their knowledge on to newcomers to the sport. How do you teach race driving? Most simply, by defining the problems a driver faces and then tackling each problem one at a time. Let's have Carl Lopez get the ball rolling by defining what a race driver has to do to go faster. Thanks, Skip. What's the one basic problem a race driver faces? A driver has to figure out how to drive around a twisty piece of asphalt in the minimum amount of time. Can't get much more basic than that. To solve this problem, let's divide up the racetrack into straights and corners and tackle each piece separately. How do we drive down the straight in the shortest time? Pretty easy. Steering wheel straight, throttle wide open. Let's try it here at Lime Rock. John McComb drives through the downhill, and the radar picks him up at 71 miles an hour coming onto the straight. He accelerates as hard as he can, throttle wide open, increasing speed all the way. Let's see how long it takes him to reach the end of the straightaway and the point at which he puts the brakes on. On this try, 11.4 seconds. Now let's have John try a little harder going through the downhill and let's see what speed he starts the straightaway at. This time 73 miles an hour. He accelerates the same way as hard as he can foot to the floor, car gaining speed all the way. And let's see if it takes him less time to get down to the end of the straight. 11 flat, four tenths quicker. I think we found out something important here. We really can't separate straights and corners because how well we do the corner directly affects how quickly we drive down the straight that follows. We can, and we do, divide the racetrack up into sections consisting of a corner and the straightaway that follows. In this way, we can decide which corners are more important than others. The most important corner is the one that leads onto the longest straight, the second most important corner leads onto the second longest straight, and so on. Let's get back for a second to the process of beating our elapsed time down the straight. Last time, we tried harder and went two miles an hour faster through the corner. We can keep trying harder and harder, but at some point, there's a limit to how hard we can drive the car. Let's take a look at what the limit means. In its simplest terms, the limit really means just using 100% of the car's potential ability. Now, a car can only do three things. It can accelerate, it can decelerate, and it can corner. The essential difference between a race driver and someone who drives a car on the street is the race driver is always interested in extracting 100% of the potential ability out of the car. There's a strong temptation to get wrapped up in technical mumbo jumbo when you talk about the limits of a car. Drivers think about changing shock absorbers, sway bar settings, wings, camber angles, caster angles. But for a moment, forget about all the black magic stuff and think of a car as merely four patches of rubber in contact with the road. It's the ability of these contact patches to grip the asphalt that determines how well the car accelerates, brakes, and turns. Now, driving a car to the limit of its accelerating ability when it doesn't have a ton of horsepower is relatively easy to do. You just keep the throttle to the floor, and there's no problem with wheel spin. 
However, when you move up to a car with 750 horsepower, it takes considerable skill to accelerate a car at the limit of its ability to do so. Let's explore extracting 100% of the cornering ability out of the car. Now, we said we wanted to drive down the straightaway faster by driving through the corner harder. By harder, we mean using a greater and greater portion of the tire's ability to provide cornering force. Now, we can experiment with the maximum cornering force of a car safely on a skid pad. What we'll do is just turn the steering wheel a bit and drive away. Now, at low speeds, here at 20 miles an hour, it doesn't take much traction to keep the car turning. But as we go faster and faster, the percentage of traction in the tires that it takes to keep the car on the circle gets higher and higher. Here, at 38 and a half miles an hour, we're up to 98%. At the limit, or 100% of the traction in the tires, we've got the car up to 38 and 3 quarters miles per hour. Now there's a radius that coincides with this. We're turning the car in a radius of 100 feet. What would happen if we decided to go faster, if we pushed on the throttle some more? Would the car roll over on its side? No, it would take that extra speed, but it wouldn't on the same radius. The radius would increase, in this case, to 106 feet. If we went faster still, the radius would increase once more. Here we're at 41 miles an hour at 112 foot radius. Now here's the most important point. Once a car is being driven at the limit of its turning ability, the radius of the arc is directly related to the maximum speed you can carry on that arc. Let's try this straight again. This time John drives onto the straightaway using the maximum cornering ability of the car on the same path he's been on. And using 100% of the cornering ability, he does get the entry speed onto the straight up to 80 miles an hour should take him less time to finish the straightaway. It does, it's down to 10.2. But now let's use what we just learned about the radius and let John go outside, inside, outside on a big arc and he's at 80 miles an hour without using the car very hard. Now let's have him use the big arc but drive the car at its limit. His exit speed is up to 97 miles an hour. Coming onto the straight at 97 and accelerating as hard as he can, it should take him a lot less time to get down to the end. Let's see what his elapsed time is down to 9.4, the best yet. This whole business of running long radius arcs through the corners is the crux of finding the racing line. And the racing line, simply, is the fastest path or route around the racetrack. And it's the starting point in any driver trying to go faster. Now, why should it be the starting point? Ask yourself what determines how fast a car can go through a corner. Once the driver's learned to drive the car at the limits of its cornering capability, the radius of the arc determines how fast it can go. The line, in other words, determines theoretically how fast a car can go in a corner. Next thing to consider is what one thing determines how fast a car can go at the end of a straight. The speed it carries on to the straight really does that. Again, the biggest arc through the corner yields the highest straightaway entry speed and the fastest time down the straight. I'm assuming here that the maximum acceleration of the motor is being used. Since the line ultimately determines the limits of both the cornering and the straightaway speed, we think it's the ideal place to start. What would be the next step? We've seen that using more of the tire's cornering force increases speed. Once a driver's driving on the proper arc, the next most important skill he needs is to develop car control the ability to drive a car at its cornering limit. The third skill to develop is the ability to slow the car down using 100% of its ability from high straightaway speeds to the speed at which you're going to enter the corner. Let's go over our logical list again. First we find the line. Next we develop our car control so that we get higher corner exit speeds. Finally we work on braking. Let's go back to Carl and get more deeply into the line. Okay, let's start with a simple corner. What we're going to try to do is to make the biggest possible radius arc through this piece of road that we can. We're going to start at the very outside edge of the road and with one smooth turn of the wheel, put the car on an arc that just touches the inside edge and then just touches the outside edge again on the way out. Let's take a look at our reference points. We have the turn in, the apex, and the tracking out point. What we'd like to be able to do is, with one smooth turn of the wheel, connect these three points with an arc with a constant radius to it. 
Let's take a look at how the steering wheel is turned. What we'd like to do is to get to our turn-in point and turn the wheel once, just enough to set the car in an arc that touches the inside edge of the road at the apex and touches the outside edge of the road again at the track out point. Looks pretty easy, but there certainly are a lot of mistakes you can make. The first one you can manage to make on the line is just not being accurate with car placement. You'd like to get the car right on the edge of the road to turn in the apex and the track out. In this case, we're three feet wide at every reference point. Let's take a look at the differences just a small mistake can make. If we miss our turn-in point by a foot, the apex by a foot, and the exit by a foot, our maximum speed through the corner is limited by an arc that connects those three points. You can see that that arc has a tighter radius to it than the arc we would have if we did it perfectly. In this case, it would cost us one mile an hour through the corner. Now, one mile an hour doesn't sound like a big deal, but watch the driver in the blue car miss the apex by about a foot and a half, and the driver in the orange car hit it right on the button. He's able to go one mile an hour faster down the straightaway, and that's a foot and a half per second. On a long straightaway like this at Watkins Glen, that's plenty enough of an advantage to pass by the end of the straight. Let's take a look at mistakes that we can make by not being accurate on our turn-in. In this example, the driver turned earlier than when the proper turn-in point is. His hand-eye coordination makes him turn the steering wheel enough to get down to the inside edge of the road. But when the car reaches the inside edge of the road, it arrives there earlier than the proper apex. Now remember, one of the things we wanted to accomplish was to be able to drive through the corner with one turn of the steering wheel from the turn-in point to the exit. In this case, if the driver holds the steering wheel in the same position, he's going to run out of road, and it's natural to try to turn the wheel tighter to keep the car on the racetrack. Now, if you're going very slowly, it's easy to turn the wheel tighter, and the car will respond and actually be able to turn on that tight radius arc late in the corner. But think about what happens if we come screaming into the corner using 100% of the turning ability of the car and arrive late in the corner and try to make the car take that tighter radius. You can turn the wheel all you like, it's just not going to happen. Now, early apexing when you're driving the car at the limit is going to get the car off the racetrack, but we can use the symptom of having to turn the wheel tighter at the exit of the corner to identify the early apex. Watch the driver have to tighten the steering wheel to keep the car on the road at the exit. Now, if we can turn early, we certainly could turn late also. This driver turns after the proper turning point, and it certainly looks safer in the second part of the corner. But the disadvantage of turning late and apexing late is that the radius you need to run is much smaller than on the proper arc. The symptom is that if you're in the second part of the corner and there's road left to the outside, you probably turn too late and apex too late. Let's take a look at that in the race car. We're going to drive up to the corner and turn in at the blue cone, which is later than it should be. One turn of the wheel touches the apex later than it should be, and at the exit of the corner there's 20 feet left to the outside. Now, a late apex is something you wouldn't want to use every lap, but if you were confronted with a corner you'd never seen before, you could intentionally turn into the corner late as a way to find the proper racing line. We'd start by turning ridiculously late, something we knew we'd never do, and seeing what happens in the second part of the corner. If there's road left to the outside, that's an indication of a late turn-in and a late apex. So next time you'd turn sooner and see what the symptom was. We're still later than we could be, so on the next try, we'd turn earlier still, aim for an earlier apex, and see where the car ended up. In this case, right on the edge of the road, so we've got it. Then what we do is to establish reference points for our turn-in, apex, and track-out, and practice driving on that proper line lap after lap after lap. This late apex technique is a great, safe way to find the way around the racetrack. Let's let Skip wrap it up. So there we have the basics of understanding the line. Again, the primary idea is to make the gentlest, biggest radius arcs through the corners. We've dealt here, of course, with the simplest corner, a 90-degree constant radius turn. Certainly, there are many other factors that complicate and change the line. The shape of the corner is one variable. Is it an increasing, decreasing radius corner or a hairpin? Pavement changes here at the Meadowlands, for example, have a great effect. Elevation changes also alter the line. Let's review all of this. And let's recall the symptoms of apexing too early and too late. If you need to turn the steering wheel more at the exit of the corner, the turn in and the apex were taken too early. On the other hand, if at the exit of the corner there's road left on the outside, the turn in and the exit were probably too late. 
recognizing reading these symptoms is a simple and effective way of finding the perfect line. Once we've solved the problem of the racing line, the next logical step is to work on car control. Peter Kuhn's up at the skid pad. Let's go have some fun. Thank you, Skip. Hi, my name is Peter Kuhn, and I'd like to show you what car control is all about. Now that we've established the line around the racetrack and we can pretty consistently drive on that line, the next step in going faster is to be able to drive the car at the limit of its adhesion in the corner. A car being driven at the limit is literally sliding across the surface of the racetrack. Car control is the ability to start, stop, or maintain that slide in the corner. Let me put my helmet on and we'll go out and give it a try. Now I know you're saying that I was already wearing my helmet, but let's go give it a shot. The next thing we're going to demonstrate will be a car that's completely neutral, that's balanced evenly from front to rear or 50-50. So when you're driving around at or near the limits, the car should be able to track exactly around and the front tires and the rear tires, when they lose their grip, will do it simultaneously. Once again, in contrast, an oversteering car would lose its grip in the rear. An understeering car would lose its grip in the front tires first. A neutral car will just simply slide all four wheels simultaneously. Let's try understeer. Understeer is usually caused when the front tires lose their grip first. And the front tires simply slide. Gross understeer is if you add horsepower and steering simultaneously. And what's happening here is the reason the circle is getting bigger around the outside of the skid pad is I've got too much steering in the car and I'm giving it too much power. If I simply just squeeze out of the gas pedal, the car will turn. This time, I'm going to just squeeze out of the throttle a little bit as we're understeering here. Let's see what happens. Let's see here. I won't move the steering wheel at all. And let's see how much the car actually turns. It turns right into the circle. So by easing off the throttle pedal, we can get the car to turn because we've simply transferred weight from the rear back to the front. And while since we're turning, that's where we want the weight. That gets us out of an understeer. There are a couple different ways that a car will oversteer and what causes that. One way oversteer occurs is by what we call trailing throttle oversteer. It's when you're driving along and you just simply lift out of the gas pedal while the car is at or near its limit. So here we are driving along. Everything feels pretty good and I'm just going to simply lift out of the gas pedal and out the rear end comes. What's happening there is by lifting out of the gas, it's transferring weight to the front tires, which suddenly say, boy, that's terrific. I've got plenty of bite now. They turn more. The rear tires then get unloaded, and they want to slide. And we'll try that one more time. We're driving along. Everything's terrific. The car is pretty close to its limits at this point. I simply lift out of the gas pedal, and out the rear end comes. Let's try a different type of oversteer. We'll get the car out to its limits here. We're right on the edge, you can hear the tires squealing. The next type of oversteer we're going to demonstrate will be power oversteer. You'll hear I'll, I'll rev the engine, I'm going to just nail the gas pedal to the floor, and by doing so, it will spin the rear tires. Okay, let's give it a try here. Sure enough, we certainly found the edge of the skid pad. So far, Peter's used throttle control to solve both understeer and oversteer problems. In addition to throttle control, the driver provides steering input to make corrections in the car's attitude. Now let's try an over, a trailing throttle oversteer with a correction. 
I do trail off the throttle and I make a correction. Let's try that again. I'm going to trail off the throttle and make a correction. You'll notice at the tail end of that I'm making what we call a recovery. So the car is at its limit. We trail off the throttle, make a correction and a recovery. Let's try it again. Trail off the throttle, make a correction and a recovery. The next thing we'll try is I'm going to do a trailing throttle oversteer condition. I'll lift out of the throttle, make a correction with no recovery. And we sail off the outside of the racetrack. That type of situation is far more common when a driver will have the car slide out from under him and go sailing off the road on the inside and not know what happened. He's simply not making a recovery quick enough. He's making a nice correction, but not making a recovery. Here we go again, trail off the throttle, make a correction and a recovery. One more time, trail off the throttle, make a correction and a recovery. In order to go quickly in a race car, it's not an uncommon situation to get an oversteer condition. What you want to try to avoid is when a tire is sliding to make it slide more. One way of making it slide more would be to add throttle. Let's try that. So we'll get the rear end to come out, add a lot of power, and around it comes. Now, this time, let's see what will happen if we have the same situation and we add just the right amount of horsepower. Tail comes out. I caught it with a little bit of power and we went back straight again. Tail comes out, make a correction, and catch it with just a little bit of power. The key words there are a little bit of power. The car doesn't want 100 horsepower at that point when the tail comes out. It didn't want 100 horsepower then and hence the reason we spun. If I came back and I gave it maybe 25 horsepower, maybe 30, maybe 40. You can actually hold the car out with just the right amount of power. I'm constantly just steering into the skid. A common mistake that's made is when a car is being driven at an extreme slip angle, in other words, when the tail is way out, is people don't follow that slide with their eyes. That's significant, and it should always be looking in the direction of the slide, looking in the direction of the slide. And you find that your eyes are following what the direction of the steering is. But as I'm adding increments of steering, the eyes are actually moving in the direction but my hands as they're turning. The more the slide gets, the more steering angle I have in, the more I'm having to look further down the road to the left. Balancing the car with the tail hung out is certainly entertaining for the driver and spectacular for the spectator. However, driving cars at extreme slip angles isn't really the fast way. A race tire generates its maximum traction at between seven to 10 degrees of slip, not a big angle. If a driver slides the car less than the seven or 10 degrees, the times are slower. If the car is sliding more, the same is true. There really is no substitute for practice when it comes to learning the feel of the perfect slip angle. Let's let Skip go over the main points we've covered. Can you believe he pays me to do this? Thanks, Peter, and thanks for volunteering to work for nothing. As we've seen, a skilled driver uses both the steering wheel and the throttle to control the car's attitude when it's cornering at the limit. We can affect the grip of the front tires by smooth throttle application. A smooth reduction increases front grip. A smooth application reduces front end traction. If we abruptly change the throttle either on or off, we can make the rear of the car slide more. On the steering end of car control, the driver must develop the ability to correct for a slide, but also be ready to recover so as not to spin in the opposite direction. At this point, we've gotten the line down, 
and we now know how to control the car at its limits during cornering. The next logical step to work on is slowing the car down from straightaway speed to cornering speed. Bruce McGinnis is down at the end of the straight. Let's have him cover the third aspect of going faster, braking. Hi folks, my name is Bruce McInnes and what we've just seen is a very good example of what we call threshold braking, which is the ability to bring the car very quickly and, uh, and efficiently to a lower speed from very high speed on the straightaway. One of the things we spend a lot of time on our school is the ability to brake and, and balance the car in hard braking in a straight line. We also really concentrate on turning with the brakes on. And the educated race watcher watches the nose go down under hard braking. It should stay down when you blip for your downshift. It should stay down when you turn. And as you turn in, the outside of the car stays down, the inside rolls up, and all four tires turn at different speeds. And this is something we look for in the program. The ability to do that enables you to brake later to keep the nose loaded when you turn, which keeps the car stable under hard braking in the corner. And also, it, it gives the car the ability to rotate as you trail off the brake to oversteer. And that enables you to open the throttle on a better angle to the apex and give you more exit speed. So there's nothing bad about turning with the brakes on. In fact, the emphasis in racing today is to turn with the brakes on, which is really the only, and the only uh, advance in racing that's taken place in the last 15 years. Neat technique. Before we get to specific skills, let's see what good braking can do for a driver. The blue car here pulls alongside going down the straight, but the pass will be made in the braking zone. The driver on the left uses the braking traction of the tire closer to the limit and consequently can drive closer to the corner before braking. Just 15 feet closer can mean the difference as it does here between second and third place. How do we attain 100% of a car's braking potential? Let's start with a little physics. When a race car is at rest, it has a certain weight distribution. That is, its total weight, in this case 1,000 pounds, is distributed between the front and rear tires. In this car, it's distributed 50-50, 500 pounds on the front and 500 on the rear. When the car decelerates, inertia transfers weight from the rear to the front. The harder the tires push on the road, the better they grip. The front pair of tires end up with better braking traction than the rears, and this bias in braking force toward the front is designed into the car. Although in most race cars, this bias is actually adjustable. Now if the driver hammers or pounces on the brake pedal, the front tires try to slow down before adequate weight transfer takes place. The result is locked front tires. Instead of slamming on the brakes, you should move your foot quickly from the throttle to the brake pedal and squeeze hard. How hard should we squeeze? Ideally, hard enough to make the tire turn 15% slower across the road surface than it would without the brakes on. Tire engineers agree that maximum braking traction comes at about 15% of slip. What happens when we push too hard? Lock up. With the wheels locked up, two bad things happen. One, we flat spot the tires, and two, the tires lose 30% of their grip, which translates to stopping distances 30% longer. The proper reaction to lockup is not, contrary to popular belief, pumping the brake pedal. A good driver relaxes the pedal pressure until the tire begins rolling again, restoring 30% of the traction lost. When it comes to straight line threshold braking, there are three common mistakes to avoid. The first is not pushing on the pedal hard enough, not using 100% of the traction available. The result? takes longer than necessary to slow the car down. The second mistake is slamming the brakes on and locking them up. The tire has significantly less traction when it's locked up and the result is longer stopping distance. The third mistake is overreacting to wheel lockup, getting off the brakes too much, then back on too hard, essentially pumping the brake pedal. Again, the result is longer stopping distances. For a very long time in motor racing, drivers were locked into the idea that they could only slow the car down in a straight line. Now it's true that when a car is going straight, a driver can threshold brake, using all of the tire's ability to slow down, since none of that ability has been used to corner. But, and it's a big but, there are many occasions when a driver needs to be able to slow the car down while it is turning. Let's take a look at a specific corner where this is true. In this decreasing radius corner, the car can't do the tight second part faster than 50 miles an hour. The driver who can't brake while turning must have the car slowed down to 50 before the road turns. Clearly the car could go faster in the first part. 
The radius is three times that of the second tighter part. In this particular case, we could do it at 85. The straight line breaker would probably sense that they're going 35 miles an hour too slow and would accelerate again, accelerate up to the slowest part of the corner and then put the brakes on again. Accelerating to the slowest part can't be right. Why not start braking in a straight line, then mix braking and turning, say 20% braking and 80% turning, and decelerate to the slowest part of the corner, gradually going from 75 to 50 miles an hour. We've managed to put the brakes on later than the straight line breaker. Consequently, we're faster at the end of the straight, and we're faster from the first turn in point all the way to the second turn in point of the corner. He's limited himself because he's convinced he has to do all his braking on the straight. We have an example here of threshold braking being followed by the driver trailing off the brakes as he enters the corner and slowing down the car as quickly as possible. This particular car has too much rear bias, which is why the tail came out. In some instances, we don't threshold brake at all. In this left-hander, the driver actually turns into the corner before he slows the car down, mixing, braking, and turning. We believe that to be a complete race car driver, one should be able to slow the car down while it's turning. Trail braking alone won't take seconds off your lap time. But we found through the use of our onboard computer that it definitely is faster. Call it trail braking, brake turning, weight management, or whatever. You can bet that successful race drivers use it, whether they're conscious of it or not. Watch the best drivers enter corners. If the cars have brake lights, see where the lights go. Braking is a complex skill, and trail braking is just one aspect of slowing for corners. Let's let Bruce finish up on the subject. Thanks, Skip. One of the best things a racing car does today is brake, and we're often asked how deep into the corner we should trail brake. Any braking, straight line or trail braking, depends very much upon the amount of speed loss needed to enter the corner. If we need to lose 100 miles an hour, there'll be a lot of threshold braking and trail braking. Less speed loss requires less of each. Another factor is how early into the corner we need our cornering force. In very tight corners, we need a lot of cornering ability just past the turning point, so we trail off the brakes quite quickly. Sometimes we need to lose just a little speed, and it makes sense not to threshold brake at all, but to brake more lightly so as not to upset the balance of the car. In this situation, we might also consider just simply using our left foot on the brake and not taking our foot off the gas. We trail the brakes just slightly past the turn-in point and have a nicely balanced car ready for an aggressive application of throttle. Sometimes a small amount of speed loss can be managed without the brakes at all. Just to lift off the throttle can slow the car enough. However, we have to be careful not not to continue that lift too much past the turn-in point and create a TTO. A wildly tail-out car would probably cause us to get the power on later, causing us both exit speed and lap time. In racing, you have to really know where to go slow as well. And one of the real character builders in racing is trying to brake later than you should. Rather than just being brave and braking, you can use a reasonable procedure for braking later and later. Step one is to be certain that we're using maximum braking. Push harder and harder at the same braking point each lap until we get a little lockup. Then start moving the braking point closer to the corner each lap. When you're so deep that the throttle comes on later, that's too deep. Remember, 10 feet earlier on the power typically means a tenth of a second, while 10 feet later on the brakes usually means only a hundredth. Certainly you can see that braking is a big part of this sport, but I wish it were that simple. The hard part in racing is to be able to brake and downshift at the same time. If you release brake pressure when you blip for your downshift, for every foot you release, you must brake that much earlier. The purpose of the downshift is simply to be in the right gear for the exit of the corner, and to talk about that is Harry Reynolds. What I'd like to talk about today a little more is about the footwork, what you do with your feet. Going down into the footwell of the car, the first pedal you see on the left is the dead pedal or foot brace. Next to it is the clutch pedal operated by your left foot. On the other side of the steering column is the brake pedal operated by your right foot. You'll see when the brake pedal is all the way down hard, the, uh, it just comes even with the accelerator or gas pedal next to it. We'll tell you in a second why that is. And of course the final pedal on the right is the accelerator. The real um, challenge of driving a race car um, is the inner reaction of the hands and the feet. That's the hard thing to do. Um, obviously, it's not too hard to accelerate a car up through the gears, but to maintain the proper level of braking, the threshold braking that Bruce talked about, while you're downshifting coming into a corner so that you're prepared to come out of the corner in the proper gear, that's the difficult thing to do. We'll talk a little bit about how this heel and toe double clutching works. 
Why downshift a race car? Many people would say that it helps slow the car down. That is not the purpose. The primary purpose is to get the car into the proper gear to drive through and away from the corner. The brakes slow the car down. What's the proper gear for a corner? It depends on the circumstance. The gear where the motor is in an RPM range where it makes power. A gear can be too high, the engine RPMs are too low, or the gear can be too low, the engine RPMs too high to the point where the motor is being damaged. The ideal gear would allow the driver to keep the motor in the RPM power band from the throttle application point to the exit of the corner. How do you do the downshift? Sadly, most race cars don't have synchronized transmission, so the driver, if he doesn't want to damage the gearbox, has to synchronize the revs of the next lower gear manually. Now, as we look inside the car, we see the driver shifts from a higher gear to neutral, lets the clutch out, revs the motor, we call it a blip, then shifts to the next lower gear. It sounds complicated and time-consuming, but remember the driver is always slowing the car for a corner when a downshift occurs, and there's adequate time to do it properly. The routine is brake, shift to neutral, blip, shift to the next lower gear. The driver's foot must be on the brake pedal even during the blip. We heel and toe to be able to continue braking and blip the throttle. Actually, you don't use the heel and toe, but the ball and the right quarter of your foot. As you can see, things are getting a little more hectic. Where do we shift? Certainly, we can do it too soon. Shifting down a gear just as you touch the brakes would over-rev the motor. We can do it too late after the throttle application point, and there we'd be groping for a gear when we should be hard on the throttle accelerating for the next straight. Anywhere between these two extremes is okay. A driver would prefer to do the downshift while going straight. One of the most common downshifting mistakes that leads to spins is if the driver under blips, doesn't rev the motor high enough in neutral to make the clutch engagement smooth. If the motor is turning too slowly, the compression of the motor will try to slow the rear tires as the clutch comes out, and around it goes. Should a driver go through every gear, go from fourth to third to second, for example? Our advice would be yes, unless the car is slowing so quickly that there isn't time to move the lever that fast. Listen to this downshift. Good job. Fourth to first with a big blip. In gear and ready to accelerate out of the corner. We feel double clutching is an important skill to learn. But what happens when the clutch fails one hour into a 12-hour race? Don't panic. Here we see a driver shifting without the clutch. The main thing to remember is bigger blips. A skilled race driver could nurse the gearbox by double clutching for 11 hours without damaging it. A gorilla race driver would soon have to park it. It is our feeling that one should learn how to drive a race car the right way, not the easy way. Race driving is not easy and anyone who thinks so is wrong. What it is is exciting, challenging and rewarding, especially if done well. So far, we've been doing our homework, understanding the line, working on our car control, developing our footwork, and understanding braking. Now it's time to take these skills to the track. Let's go with Carl Lopez as he explores Lime Rock and tries to go faster. Lime Rock is a 1.53 mile circuit in northwestern Connecticut with a majority of fast sweeping curves and some breathtaking elevation changes. The first corner is called Big Bend, a decreasing radius corner that's a good trail braking entry and a heck of a challenge in the middle to slow the car down for the tighter part. The left-hander is an important compromise corner where a late apex is the key. The left-hander is always slippery. It's followed with a very challenging and off-camber right-hander that leads on to no-name straightaway. Your first real thriller is the uphill, a corner where you can drive in earlier than you think you can and get caught by the hill when the car compresses. West Bend is pretty straightforward, 90 degree right-hander, but no room for error at the exit. The downhill will get your attention also. You turn in when the car compresses at the bottom of the hill, and it can be taken in many cars flat in top gear. When we head out onto the racetrack, one of the first things we want to think about is that we're going to start with the racing line. We're not in a hurry to go fast. And regardless of the racetrack we're driving on, what we're first looking for is our reference points. Where we're going to turn the car into the corner, what we're looking for for apexes, where our brake points are going to be. Let's start here. In the left-hander, for example, you want to keep the car high. It's a very late apex, and you want to help yourself by looking at the curve early in the corner. 
the right-hander, there's a good reference point for a turn and there's a chunk of asphalt missing. There's a point at the curb that marks the apex better than a pylon. While we're waiting to come up to the next corner, we think about where we're going to look in our mirrors, take a look at the gauges, both the oil pressure and the water temp. Coming up to the uphill, we're looking for a crack in the road. We can't turn in at it, but we can turn in three feet past it. In the uphill, we have to keep in mind as we come up over the hill, the car's going to lose traction, and we need to straighten the steering wheel, or else we'll spin the tires and go off the road to the inside. West Bend is pretty simple. 90 degree right hander, we can use for an apex mark a red paint dot that someone put down there. You have to go out every time you go to Lime Rock to make sure it's still there. When we leave the corner, we want to let the car track all the way to the outside and use half of the yellow stripe, which is a foot and a half wide. In the downhill, you can use the compression of the springs when the car hits the straightaway to indicate where your turning point should be. When you get around the apex of the downhill corner, the road cambers a lot, so you're able to actually pinch the car a little bit and make it change direction some more at the apex. And you have to remember in the downhill to let it track all the way to the outside of the road. Okay, let's get down to business. We have an idea of where our reference points around the racetrack are. We want to get out on the track and start to go a little bit faster first basics we're attending to here are to make sure the mirrors are set appropriately so that you can see other traffic out on the racetrack. And we want to get the car up to operating temperature. We're interested in making sure that the oil pressure is up to its normal value, making sure that the water temperature is up at least to 160 degrees so we don't damage the motor. And one of our first jobs as we go around here is to make sure that the brakes are reasonably warm. I'm dragging my left foot on the brake pedal while my right foot is on the throttle. I have to have small feet to do that but I'm building some temperature in the brakes so that when we get down to our first brake application, we've got some stopping power there. In many cars, um, depending upon the type of tire they have, you have to spend a lot of time warming the tires up too. Some tires are very sensitive to the temperature that they have in them and won't perform at all if they're cold. We're lucky to have the Comp TAs on these cars because they respond really well all the way across the temperature ranges. One of the neat things about the tire is that it's very predictable. You can, if you make a big mistake, get the car pretty far sideways and it just won't spit you off the racetrack and give up. On this first exploratory lap, we're trying to get a feel for the car, trying to get a feel for the racetrack again. It's very possible that since the last time we've been out, somebody's gone out there and blown 20 quarts of oil all over the line. You wouldn't want to get out of the pit lane and really let it fly the first time out. Okay, we come down into the big bend the first time been very conservative on the braking. Gone down to about the three or so. And since we haven't carried a lot of speed down the downhill, it's been really no problem getting that done. Brakes are pretty hot right now. I've been able to drag them around the first lap, so they should work pretty well by the time we get to Big Ben next time around. Okay, the engine's good and warm, so we're starting to accelerate harder going up to the uphill. We're able to pick out our reference point for the turn in pretty well. Decent apex and straightening the wheel up over the top. We only got 5300 that time, but we're not really into it quite yet at the exit. Line through West Bend is just fine. We're looking for 53. Got 5300 at the exit that time. There's more to go. So far, we're braking reasonably in the downhill. Want to wait till we get really warmed up to go any further on that. Okay, we should be able to work our braking point down toward two and a half. Pressures and temperatures are fine. Braking at the two and a half, whoop, overdid it a little bit. I locked the left front there. I think I got a little bit greedy. Maybe a little bit more conservative. I might have to warm it up a little bit more than I thought. Taking a look at the exit of the left-hander, 4,900. Remember to keep it high in the left-hander. Look for the curb. Got it, pretty decent pass. And with my foot on the floor, I'm able to take the right-hander let it track to the outside, 49. Once we really get it going, it should be around 51 or so. On the way to the uphill, I'm gonna brake lighter this time, turn it in and on the power earlier. Foot to the floor, straighten the wheel at the crest, 54 this time. Okay, reasonable braking coming into West Bend and squeeze the power on. A little wide of the apex that time, we look at the exit, 54. Shift to fourth, a little lighter braking in the downhill this time. 
clouded the curve reasonably while they are looking at the exit just about five. As we work our speed up, the downhill will get closer and closer to flat. Pressures and temperatures okay. We'd be more conservative in the braking, do two and three quarters this time. Still lock the left front just a little bit. Okay, throttle on hard through the apex. Let it track to the outside. 5,000, getting better. Keep it high in the left-hander. When you get to the apex, it's gonna slide some more when it hits the bumps. Decent correction, foot flat on the floor, take the right. Just about five. Okay, I'm gonna try to just brush the brakes on the way to the uphill this time and try to more aggressively get on the throttle. Power was on earlier, not bad. 54.50. Okay, less braking in the West Bend this time. And more, more power. 54 again, not bad. Okay, much lighter braking in the downhill, turn it in. Flat on the floor, got to let it track in the off camber, it worked. 5,000. Okay, Peter's been behind us on the way, just pointed him by. He's safely by and directly ahead of us. Let's see how his line looks. Whoa, wide of the apex and tossing the car in, really sideways. I have a feeling maybe Peter's trying to give us a bad example here. Look at that, six feet wide of the apex. We're able to really eat him up at the exit because he's having to turn a tighter line. Early into the left-hander, he's going to be really out of shape. Why do the apex of the left and turning tremendously late in the right? If this were a racing situation, I'd go by underneath him with ease. Peter's putting out a heck of a display here of what you shouldn't do in a race car, cooperating nicely. Turned very late in the uphill that time. Whoa! Careful air fella. Now we have to be careful not to follow Peter and just mimic everything he does. Whoa, that time turned very early. Whoa! I'm not sure he wanted to be quite that graphic on an early apex. Pretty successful staying away from his accident in that case. Okay, we come out to the straightaway, looking a lot better. But I think I'll just stay behind him and see what he's going to do next. Let's just let him go and start thinking about lowering the lap time around here. Okay, we've done six or seven laps and gotten comfortable with the racing line around here. I know it reasonably well. Confident in our ability to turn in at the approximately right point and put the car close to the apex. So let's start knocking down the lap time now. We're in the low one minute, three second bracket and let's try to whittle that down under two. This is very much like a qualifying session. Showing us a 3-3, three, three. that's a 103-3. Three, three. One way we're gonna try to lower this time is not by skipping over the throttle application and exit speed part and going directly to the braking, but concentrate on losing a little less speed at the entry of the corners and getting the power on sooner. I'm flat here. Turning into the right, using the camber to turn the car, and letting it track. We're at 51 at the exit there. Good pass. I'm going to go to the uphill. I want to brake lighter this time and concentrate on getting the power on early. Here. Flat on the floor. Let it track. 55. Good pass. Got to concentrate on less braking and more power here in West Bend. Very smooth, but I can do it better next time just brush the brakes in the downhill and on the power soon. 49. We've got to work on the downhill here. That'll help. Downhill and the uphill in West Bend are the keys. 2-2. Two, two. That's faster than I thought it might be. Okay, a little light braking in the middle. Second gear and try to get the power on full. Good. It's home free. 5. Almost 51. Left-hander. Be conservative. Compromise. Okay, power's on flat, a little bit of a correction there, slid more than I wanted it to. Clouded the curb harder than I wanted it to. Still got 51 at the exit, so that's not bad. Okay, uphill, light braking and early throttle application. Get it home early. Flat. Hit the hill. 56, all right. Want to get on the power really early in West Bend. Just tap the brakes and on it. Good, hit the curb more than I wanted to. 55, good. Quick shift to fourth. No brakes, flat. 
let it track. Good. Good, that feels great. What are they going to show me? One nine, all right. Okay, well, that was a little too deep. I don't know. Quick shift a second. Get on the power. 51, good pass. Okay, conservative in the left. Don't let it pitch as much as last time. Not bad. Not bad. A little late on the throttle application, though. 51 at the exit again. One of these days I'll get 52. Okay, very light braking and really early power here. On the power. Ooh, hit the curb more than I wanted to. 55 again. Okay, let's do West Bend like we did last time. Just a touch of the brakes and on the power early. Ooh, too much curb. 55, still a good pass. Okay, flatten the downhill. Little lift. Right on the line, that's the best I've done. Can't use much more road at the exit there, or I'll be in the dirt. What are they showing? Okay, not bad. There's a 1.5 in here somewhere. Okay. Now it's tempting to just give up and drag the car into the pit lane, but you have to take care of the car on the way in also. You've got to let the brakes and tires cool down, let the motor temperature drop 20 degrees. If we just bring it in hot, we can literally boil the fluid in the calipers if you brought it in with the discs and calipers red hot. You also want to make sure that even though it's a cool off lap, you crank your mental attention up as high as possible. A lot of cars have been written off on a cool off lap. Although it feels slower than you've been going, it's very easy to forget that you're still going over 90 miles an hour. Taking a good look at the water temperature gauge down to, well, it's about 170 now. Maybe it'll get more to 165 before we pull in. I haven't used the brakes yet on this lap. I'm trying to let the air go over them and cool them off. Okay, I've got my left hand in the air, letting anybody behind me know I'm heading for the pit lane. I keep the car to the right coming in so that anybody online would pass me on the outside. Okay, again, I want to use very light brakes as I bring the car in and not store up some heat in the pads and calipers. Whew, that was fun. Let's go to Bruce up in the tower. I think he's got more technical stuff to talk about. Let's first take a look at a graph that will graphically demonstrate the three areas of work that the car can do. One of the first generalizations we made was that the car is capable of braking, turning, and acceleration. On the horizontal line, we'll graph the car's cornering potential. Let's say that we've tested this particular car and it could give us 1G of cornering force. We were lucky enough that this car turned right as well as it turned left, so its potential on the left side of the graph is the same. If we wanted, we can use amounts of cornering force anywhere along this red line. Let's take a look at its other capabilities. Let's put its ability to brake on the vertical line. If the car is capable of cornering at about 1G, it should be capable of braking at 1G. Again, we have the option to use any portion of its braking ability along the red line, if we want to. We could graph acceleration on the bottom side. In reality, very few cars are powerful enough to accelerate at 1G. But what about mixing abilities? If we instrument a car and identify all of the different combinations of acceleration and cornering that this car is capable of, we could then plot these on this graph. As the points accumulate, they make up a shape of the bottom half of the circle. This semicircular graph is the beginning of the friction circle. Once again, this graph is a great way of looking at the combination of abilities that the car is capable of. Most race cars break and corner far better than they accelerate, so the shape of the bottom of this graph is proportional to this ability. In most cases, it's a little flatter along the bottom. Once we've found the line, our next step to going faster is to begin our acceleration as early as we can. If we start accelerating during the corner, we're going to somehow mix the ability of the car to accelerate with its ability to turn. Take a look at a combination here. If we begin putting on the power and accelerating on the way out of the corner, what happens to our cornering force? It decreases. Put on more power and it decreases again. Now as the cornering force decreases, what is going to have to happen to the radius of our arc? As we drive out of the corner, the radius of the arc slightly increases. Once we start getting serious about squeezing on the power and carrying speed onto the straightaway, we are going to have to be prepared to unwind the steering wheel slightly as we come off the corner. What about mixing the braking and turning abilities of the car? Let's use the instrumented car again and find all the braking and turning combinations, plot them, and we've completed the friction circle. 
Let's use the friction circle to follow a car through a trail braking entry into a corner. First, maximum braking. Less than threshold would be lower. At threshold braking, how much cornering force is available? None. But relaxed braking force and cornering potential is created. Relax more braking and we get more cornering force. Following the circle, we see that we have a car that gains cornering force on the way in and loses it on the way out. Our early concept of a single radius arc through the turns has gotten slightly more complicated. In reality, we have a slightly decreasing radius arc into the corner and a slightly increasing radius arc out. Still, the reference points we found for our turn in, apex, and track out by using a single radius are essentially the same. I like the friction circle because it's a great way to visualize how the car approaches its limits. When we were working with Chris Wallach of MRG developing our onboard computer system, we had Chris design in the friction circle as one of the system's primary graphic displays. Now we have the ability to punch in the coordinates of a corner we want and follow the car through the braking zone and into the corner. This driver is not perfectly straight when he's braking, although his braking level is quite good. He's doing a very, very good job of trail braking. He's got the car pretty close to the limit in cornering and right on the limit in acceleration and turning on the exit. Excellent job. So far we've been building our racing knowledge using all-out rear-wheel drive cars on dry pavement, the perfect conditions. But let's for a bit go past the basics to two special cases, front-wheel drive cars and soaking wet racetracks. How do we adapt to these special situations? Let's start by looking at front-wheel drive and go up to the skid pad. Hi, I'm Terry Yearwood, and I have the privilege today of talking about a front-drive race car, or front-drive street car. I've been fortunate this year to run in the Firestone Firehawk Endurance Series in a Dodge Shelby, which we won several races in. We found early in the season, though, you had to treat a front drive car a little differently than a rear drive. Going back to or discussing hand position versus right foot position, we were talking about the brake pedal and we're into a threshold brake mode. If you ask the hands to turn the front tires, you'll begin sliding the front tires. That's why we're beginning to the term of trail braking where the more you turn your hands, the less you can afford to apply brake pressure so you don't lock the front tires. A common mistake is to leap out of the brakes prematurely, ask the car to turn, and want to go to horsepower simultaneously. That just smokes the front tires. There's no traction available, and the car understeers or power understeers all the way to the exit with no exit speed. However, if we can work out something in the front drive car to make the rear point some, not smoke the front tires, we can actually dial some steering out of the vehicle, and the less we have to steer, the more the right foot can press on the horsepower. In the case of an autocross or a street car, where we need to really turn the vehicle, without any modification, we actually can use the handbrake or the emergency brake. The emergency brake puts a little rear brake bias in the car, the rear begins to slide or point, and the more the rear points, the more power available. In the road race car, we're able to put a little negative camber in the front tires by tucking the front tires in at the top. That helps the front end point. You can also combine that with a little bit of toe out at the rear of the car. Toe out means we take the rear tires and actually point them away from each other. So as you begin to turn the car in with the steering wheel, the rear tires act like a trailer and they actually begin to point the vehicle in down to the apex. The more the rear can point, the less you have to steer the car, the more power is available. A big plus in a front drive car, especially in an autocross or a racetrack situation, is once you begin to slide the rear, if you have made a mistake and over-rotated the car, the rear end's coming around more than you really like to, you actually can dial in your steering input like a rear drive car, but the big plus here is you can actually begin to squeeze back some power and the front end will tug itself back straight. Just be sure you aim the tires where you'd like the car to go. And just squeeze back on the power, and the front end can pull itself out of the skid as opposed to a rear drive car. All right, let's, let's recap the front drive car. Number one, be extremely patient with your throttle foot. Don't ask it to power until you've gotten your hand some semblance of straight. Otherwise, you're going to frustrate yourself with power understeer. Secondly, let's fix the car, if possible, where it can help point. In other words, a little bit of toe out at the rear, a little rear brake bias, possibly even just adjusting tire pressures a little more in the front than you have in the rear can help a car rotate or point without a whole lot of expense. 
And if you do get the car over-rotated, if the rear end really wants to come around with you, dial your steering correction in. And in the front drive car, you can squeeze back on a bit of power and the front end can actually begin to tug itself back straight. Race morning is always a nervous time. Drivers with years of experience can't shake the butterflies. You try to be calm, but it's nearly impossible, especially if it's your first race. It helps if all the details are in order. You need to know the schedule and you should be ready on time. If you're racing your own car, all but the last minute prep should have been done the night before. Your driving equipment should be ready and all in one place. Dress a little early. First underwear and socks, then the suit. Shoes made of Nomex with leather bottoms. Head soccer balaclava. Helmet with a clean visor. And of course we want the best gloves possible. Okay, we're just about ready. Let's hope the sun is shining and there's no rain in sight. I hate the rain. I hate the rain! We absolutely hate it. <laughs> I love driving in the rain. I'm Mike Samicki from Skip Barber Racing and I'd like to talk about the rain right now. The main thing that makes the rain different is simply remembering three major areas that you're concerned with. The first one is maintaining your ability to see. The second one, what you would do on the line to make that different around the racetrack. And the third being what you do to the car to make it function better in the rain. Let's talk about maintaining your ability to see. One of the first things you might do is, as you can see on the car right here, we've put a windscreen on to try and keep water off the outside of the visor. What this windscreen does is help deflect air up and over the top of your uh, helmet more and keeps more of that rain from hitting your visor directly. Let's take a look at the helmet now. On the helmet, one of the first things you want to do is change the visor. You want to go for either a clear visor like I have on this helmet here or perhaps even a yellow visor to brighten the day up even more and help with the contrast. A new visor is a great idea. If you drive out of the pits with a visor that's been on for the past four years, and it's got lots of stone chips and, sta and sand marks on it, the water is going to get held into the small pores and blur your vision even more. What you're looking for with a newer visor is that it is smoother and the water beads up and blows off of it easily. The other thing you're concerned with is fogging on the inside. Imagine driving down the straightaway, 120 miles an hour, it's raining out, you're in the middle of a race, pretty high tension thing, a lot of sweat happening inside of that helmet, a lot of tension, a lot of heat, a lot of fog, all right? You're really concerned with fogging on the inside. One of the first things you want to do is try some anti-fog treatment on the inside of the helmet. There's plenty of commercially available anti-fog treatments that you can put on there, or you can use dishwashing soap, bubble bath, whatever, some sort, of some sort of soap to coat the inside and keep the water from sticking to the inside of the visor. Another little trick that I've got on this helmet here to help with the inside fogging is this little bit of duct tape I have under the corner of the visor here. All you do is you take a strip of duct tape like this, roll it up into a little ball like I have here, and stick it under the corner of the visor so that as you shut the visor down, it deforms that leading edge and allows air to sneak up under there and circulate in there, keeping the fog down. Plenty of other little tricks you can use. I know racers that use snorkels in nose clips to keep their breath out of the inside of the visor completely. Any little trick that works, no matter how dumb it looks, whatever else, if somebody's laughing at you as you're driving out of the pits with a snorkel and you win the race, the laugh's on them. Let's take a look at the car now. Three major areas you're concerned with with the car in the rain. The first is roll stiffness, brake bias, and then the third would be rain tires versus dry tires. Let's talk about roll stiffness first. In the rain, what you want to do is soften up the sway bars to allow that car to roll easier with less cornering force. We've got a sway bar here on the back of the car that we can see quite easily. And as you can see here, I've got about five inches of travel left on it. What you would do to this sway bar in the rain is either move it right out to the end of its travel, putting it at full soft, or potentially even disconnect it. So you want to soften up both the front and the rear sway bars. Brake bias is the next thing you want to be concerned with. In the dry, you get quite a bit of force transfer to the front tires under braking. In the wet, you don't get quite as much so that more weight or force is staying on the rear of the car. So what you really want to do is to crank in or adjust in some more rear bias. Lots of race cars have an adjustment knob on the dashboard now. 
And what you would want to do on a test day is establish a baseline for how many turns of that knob that you'd put in to go out in the rain. Maybe two, maybe four, whatever it is on your race car. If you don't have that adjustment, you'd certainly want to do the same thing with the adjustment down in the footwell and figure out your baseline setting for going out in the rain. So you'd want to adjust that brake bias. The third thing, and it's one of the most perplexing things for most people going out in the rain, is rain tire versus dry tire. A key thing to remember in the whole dry tire versus rain tire dilemma is the fact that a dry tire works better in the wet than a wet tire works in the dry. Let's go out to the racetrack and take a look at things. There are two fundamental ways we're going to change the line for the rain. In this example, Mike is driving on the normal dry line, theoretically the correct way, and he's going to generate an exit speed of 61 miles an hour. In the second example, he's going to drive around the outside of the corner, where it's more granular, no oil, and it's not polished. His exit speed is going to be five miles an hour faster. When it's wet, one of the easiest things to change is where you drive on the racetrack. Does the car lose as much cornering ability as it does acceleration ability? Let's take a look at the monitor and find out. What's coming up on the screen for us now is a friction circle. The corner that's being illustrated is Big Ben, which is a fast right-hander. What we have here is the braking coming up down into the uh, end of the straightaway, cornering loads feeding in with trail braking, and then the trail braking slowly tapering out until at this point right here it's just cornering and then blending into the acceleration. We've looked at the friction circle for a dry racetrack. Let's take a look at one for the wet and see what the difference is. What we've got coming up on the screen now is the friction circle for the wet line through Big Ben, the same corner that we were just looking at. As you can see, the braking level is much lower and the level of trail braking is much lower. So everything doesn't work quite as well. In the wet, your braking force drops down to about 0.6 of a G. Your cornering in the dry, which was 1.3, drops down to 0.65 of a G. That's a 36% loss in braking, a 50% loss in cornering. So there are a few tips for driving in the rain. Hope someday to see you at the Niagara Falls Grand Prix. The second basic line change we make capitalizes on the car's relatively big braking and accelerating capability. We light apex all the corners. In other words, brake relatively hard, change the car's direction a lot at relatively low speed, then concentrate on acceleration. Effectively, we make the racetrack a series of drag strips and braking zones. Wet or dry, the flags are critical. The yellow flag's the most important. It always means caution and no passing. It's more severe if it's waved, in which case a car might be blocking the track and you should be prepared to stop. The black flag means the driver needs to report to the pits. Sometimes it's given to the entire field and they all go to the pits. The passing flag is a way of signaling to the driver that there's a vehicle overtaking him and he should be prepared to give way. The green flag means the course is open. It's also the flag the yard starter uses to start the race. The white flag means a slow-moving vehicle, either a broken race car or a service vehicle is on the track. You can pass that vehicle. The meat ball means there's a problem with a car. It's a great time to look at your instruments before seeing your mechanic. The red flag is used differently in different parts of the world. Basically, the course is closed and you should stop. It's the only flag under which you stop on the racetrack. The striped flag used to be an oil flag, now is really a slippery flag. Checker flag means the race or the practice session is over. Great time to make up your excuses. Hopefully the understanding of racing concepts at least reminds us of how important it is to develop the physical skills and the areas of knowledge we've worked so hard on. How do we know we're improving? Up to this point in the video, lap times have been our measure. But ultimately the true yardstick is the race. Given equal cars, the most skilled driver finishes first, the least skilled last. It's the racing version of the report card. Let's put 16 identically prepared Formula Fords together and see who's learned their lessons best. Hopefully one of our instructors. But before we put Carl in a Ford and go racing, let's consider the whole problem of the start. Even if you've raced successfully for years, like many of these drivers in the Barbershop Pro Series, the start of a race gets your heart pounding, especially at a historic place like Watkins Glen. Of course, anxiety is not the best emotion to carry with you into the car. You've got to be ready to be either very aggressive or careful at an instant's notice. You want to be able to respond to the mayhem that sometimes accompanies a start 
and you want, above all else, to avoid being the cause or the victim of a first corner accident. Some folks, of course, are wonderfully lucky despite being horribly aggressive. Watch this guy. Okay, we're pulling out on our face lap. At the tail end of the field here. A couple of things we have to keep in mind at the start here. We want to warm up the brakes and tires. Uh, with uh, TA radios, there's no real tire warm-up that, uh, that you need to do. They perform pretty well in uh, all temperature ranges, so they're ready to go right off the bat. But it is important to get the brakes warm. It's the first thing you're going to do down in turn one. Get the brakes on. Try to outbreak people in passing situations. Now, good at the back here. Uh, it's, you're always anxious to get as many places as you can at the start, but you've got to temper that with some caution. Um, the race is 28 laps long, and you'd hate to throw it all away by doing something dumb uh, in the first 300 yards of the race by trying to really do something uh, dangerous and scary to try to pass a few folks. Now, we're not sure of the pace at the start we're going to run here. Uh, John Posey, who's on the pole, and John Thompson outside, um, John really starts races a number of different ways. He either he can start them both uh, fast and slow. Now, from a strategy standpoint, you'd like to start them slow in a class of uh, equal horsepower cars, because one of the few advantages you get when you're back here at the end is um, the advantage of the draft. With all of those cars ahead of you breaking the air, with the same horsepower and less drag, your car will go faster, and it gives you a shot at passing the folks in front of you. Now, one of the strategies involved is to go slow, because the slower you arrive in turn one, the less the draft effect. There's a green. Let's try the inside. Here's what we got. Nothing is what we got. There wasn't really enough road down there. Ooh, we got two cars hit in front of us. Definite car contact there. Okay, but luckily, nobody got launched over anybody else's wheel, and that's a real concern in open wheel cars. Okay, we got a couple not on the way to turn one, but between turn one and turn three. Let's see if we can get one more by the uphill. Well, again, the equal power is making a difference here. I'm gonna try to do them under braking. A little more comfortable, faster in the uphill here, so we've got a better shot of going deeper on that corner. A lot of folks are offline here. He's able to do a better job through West Bend. Okay, we've got kind of a late pass coming onto the straight. Through the downhill. Okay, we're not too bad. Six, seven, we're eighth after starting 16th. That's not so bad. I'll take that. Whoops, somebody's spinning. Car 25. Let's try to go around the outside of him. Whoop, 28 spinning also. Okay, got both of those fellas. They managed to eliminate themselves. That's nice of them. No car contact though. Driver's okay. Scott Featherman ahead of us in car two. Scott's been doing better and better. Good race driver, pretty heads up sort of guy. His biggest problem seems to be getting out of the pit lane. Poor Scott forgot how wide the car was a few weeks ago. Managed to clip a few cars in the pit lane, damaged three of them. The scourge of the pit lane. A decent run on the downhill. Should be able to close on Scott coming down the straightaway and draft by him. Okay, we're a little faster, we pull out, the draft advantage, yeah, we should be able to outbreak them too. Okay, got him into turn one. Now what we tried to do there is to use, again, the draft, the aerodynamic advantage of the hole in the air behind Scott's car. Let's go to Skip and have Skip talk a little bit more about both passing, passing strategy and the effect of the draft. Thank you, Carl. 
When it comes to passing, there's one major rule. It's the responsibility of the overtaking car to make a clean pass. As two cars approach the corner, the car attempting the pass has to be alongside before the other car is obligated to yield. A front wheel alongside the rear is not enough. Expect a chop. The passing driver has to assume that the car ahead is going to go for the apex. Watch this carefully because there's a little perspective problem. The white car really isn't up far enough, compounds the problem by locking up the brakes and sliding straight, and obviously causes the flip. At the same time, possibly the blue car should have seen that coming and gotten out of the way. One of the best passes to make is the drafting pass. Here we have an example at Watkins Glen with a barber sob car. The driver in the red car is timed it perfectly. He not only makes the pass, he loses no time. One of the worst things you can do in passing is to make a pass but consequently lose a lot of time. Watch the black car here. He's made the pass. It's an ill-advised pass. He's momentarily in first place, but he's about to be passed by the red car, and possibly on the ensuing straight, he'll be passed by another car as a result of a slow exit. Having a big motor, of course, is wonderful. Here's an example of a 962 about to pass a Camel light car using the horsepower. No danger, no time lost. I want to go back to the subject of drafting. This footage is from before Carl's race. We're about to see Carl try to make a drafting pass. He's pulled out too soon. He's not taken advantage of the air that is spilling off the blue car and almost the vacuum that's created behind it. He's going to have to fall back in behind the car. This time he'll do it right. He's got good exit speed. He's approaching the blue car. There's not much air in front of him. He's gaining on the blue car. He makes the last minute pop and he will go by that blue car. There's nothing the blue car can do about it. Now let's go back to Carl's race and see what of these passing techniques he uses. Okay, we're doing these corners around the back reasonably well. I'm not going to try a pass here. I'm going to just be a little patient and try to get car 55 down the straightaway. That's the easiest pass there is. Rather than trying to make up ground around the back here, let's just zoom the downhill better. Approach and coming onto the straight. That's the easiest way to do it. If we did it a little bit faster, we're letting the draft give us some speed advantage. We take that speed advantage and bring it on by. Okay, one more down. Okay, now we set our sights on car 12 here. A very good line through the left-hander there. It was wide of the apex by a bunch. It's certainly not going to help me catch car 12 any better. Okay, we're fourth now. The first two cars up front. 30 yards to the number three car. We can't get overly eager here. It's going to take a lap or two to get the car in front of me. There's no sense trying to make it all up right at the beginning. Fourth place, no tremendous hurry here. We're able to keep up with him. We actually gain on car 12 a little bit here, so it's just a matter of time. Again, the ideal place to do it is down the straightaway. There's no sweat stirring around down the straight. But in order to do that, it means doing the downhill well, leaving enough room between me and the car in front so that he doesn't block me at the apex of the downhill and determine my speed through the car. Okay, he was a little wide of West Bend. But I've got just enough room here to do the downhill just the way I want to. Gain on him coming out to the straightaway. He took the downhill a really good pass that time. So this isn't going to be the lap where I'm going to get some momentum. I'm going to be able to get by. I'm just going to follow him into Big Bend. Be conservative. Ooh, is he getting hung out? Let's maybe try it into the left.
brought him in for the left-hander that time. See, as he goes out wide to the right to take the top of the line, he leaves the inside open. If I'm good at breaking and turning, he just leave my breaking later and do my decelerating down to the apex. The ride at the apex is going slower than I normally do, but the important part is the other driver doesn't have any options. He can't go around the outside of me without slowing down a lot. I certainly can't occupy the space that the apex would win. So we we'll draft by on car 25 here. We're getting closer to the leaders now. They're at a bit of a disadvantage now because they are... Uh, they might be very busy racing with each other, slowing each other up a tad. Well, I'm just clear to run in their way. Fight for first and second, dead ahead of us. Car five. And the other red car, which I think is 25. Okay, now if we get it through the downs here well, we should be able to get a good tow out of a couple of these cars. And this lap might be the lap we can go by. We'll see. a little bit by car five there. You really couldn't be able to uh, Now I was even with car five in the braking zone there, so there was nothing nothing chancy about that pass and he yielded the line since I was dead even with him in the braking zone. Still, I didn't just assume that I could move out and take up his space on the racetrack either. I tried to keep it tucked in, giving him the option if he wanted to play that way to just drive around the corner, the outside of the corner with me. So we've got a right flag out that means a slow race car or a service vehicle on the racetrack. And sure enough, there's a blue car pulling off the inside. It was no problem. Run on the leader. Simply pull out of the draft. Down to the number three. Not broken. Okay, car 25. It looks like car 8 might have gotten caught out in the uh, water that's down around the uh, inside edge of the road in the first part of Big Ben. Someone must have gone up there and splashed some water on the racetrack. I saw that last lap, and it was to the right of uh, where our normal racing line is, so I was able to avoid it just by being lighter. Okay, we got the lead. Now the thing to do is to put in a couple of laps as perfectly as you can manage. Let the fellows behind you try to match your preciseness. It's a little harder to do when there are cars in your mirrors, for certain. What's the pressure on? a racetrack like this, the draft advantage is something to always be to reckon with. Now John's coming up behind me here, and he's going to try me on the inside, taking the advantage of the draft. Okay. Go back to second again. Lost the position on the draft block. Okay, now John's pretty slow at the entry to the left-hander. So if you don't draft by him, come out to the straightaway of this lap, we'll try him in the left.
let's see what we can do. We're getting some distance between. Whoop! Somebody got offline back there. I think John might have gotten. Yep, the red car got passed by the black car. as we can to do perfect laps here. Hopefully we get enough distance on the cars behind us so the draft doesn't become a factor. We're getting close. The car behind me is about seven car lengths back, and that's kind of the tail end of any draft advantage. Let's see. Yep, I don't think he's going to be able to get a draft by shot on us now. Just playing too flat, too far back. Okay, we're out in front. What we need to do be consistent. Don't catch the tail out too much like I just did. Put the pressure on the guys behind you to do as accurate a job as you're trying to do. Not such a good day off to the right hander. We're used to seeing 51 and a 49. I've got a little bit in the uphill. That's great fun. I'm at an advantage in this field, having driven this racetrack about 10,000 laps and for about seven years, and the folks we're racing against are a real cross-section of the kind of students that run with us. Uh, we've got folks that are doing their first race ever, fellows who have done 15 years of racing before they've even come to us. We've got at least three fellows in the field that are interested in pro careers and really want to go to Indy. Let's go to Skip up on the hill and have him put the whole thing together. Other sports have traditionally had coaches. Even Jack Nicholas has a coach. But until recently, race drivers have been largely self-taught. When I started racing, drivers were very secretive about their knowledge. In fact, if another driver told you how to drive your race car, you could be pretty sure he was telling you the opposite of what he thought. That's all changed with the advent of driving schools. The last couple of years, a third of the starting field at Indianapolis have trained with us. And those guys really talk to each other about their car problems and about how to drive the race car. Racing is a tremendously difficult sport that usually takes years to master. And here we are trying in a short tape to tell you how to do it. Obviously, we've only been able to deal with the fundamentals. But as your experience increases, and as you get more time in the car and get confronted with more sophisticated problems, you'll find that the solution to those problems is in the basics we've dealt with here. These methods, these techniques work. You ought to refer back to them. If you are able to go racing, you ought to be realistic about the financial aspects. It always costs more than you would like. And what you need to do is spend your money wisely. You have to get a lot of seat time. You're much better off driving a slow car 15 or 20 hours a year than you are driving a bullet an hour and a half. Speaking for the Skip Barber Racing School and for our race series, I hope you've enjoyed this tape, and we'd all like to thank you for watching. Thank you. <laughs>